Week 13 in the NFL has officially concluded. Welcome into the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Falcons come away with a 13-8 victory on the road at the soggy, wet, mm. <laughs> uncomfortable New York Jets. But sometimes it gets like that when you get into November, December, and January in the National Football League, especially when you're traveling up north. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today. We I'll ask the guys here if they remember their worst games that they've played as an NFL player or even in their college days. We will break down the matchup between the Jets, <laughs> talk about some of the defense because uh, the defense has been the difference maker the last couple of weeks, and then we'll just quickly review the state of the NS NFC South as we move forward. Um, guys, before I ended up getting into the show, uh -oh. I felt like it was a good thing to do to congratulate Bradley Pinion on being uh, the nominee for the Atlanta Falcons for the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Sure. Uh, that was just announced, I believe, today as we record. Um, considered one of the most prestigious awards in the National Football League. It is given to a player that has outstanding community service activities off the field as well as excellence on the field. So uh, Atlanta knows all too well about this with having Calais Campbell on the roster. He won the whole thing for the National Football League a few years ago. But Bradley Pinion will be the representative for the Atlanta Falcons this year. So congratulations, yeah, congratulations to him Brad. doing a fantastic job on special teams. Um, guys, before we get into the game, the reason why we talk about worst weather NFL games is uh, because it was yucky up there. First of all, Arch, was it bad in New York? Was it just soggy and wet or was it awful? The wind was blowing, so that that adds okay. to it. And then the temperature, the temperature wasn't bad. Um, we've all played in nasty weather games, and the worst weather you can play in, in my opinion, uh, is about 38, 39, 40 degrees and raining. Yeah. yeah, that that's the worst because you get wet and you're cold, and you can't. There's nothing yeah, in between. <laughs> you play in the snow, you brush the snow off. Yeah, there's a little wetness there, but it's still it, it's it's. I don't know. There's, it's not nearly as severe as rain, wind, and cold weather. Yeah. So the temperature wasn't as bad as it could have been. But when I got up Sunday morning and you know pulled the curtains back on the room, and there was stuff flying by the window, <laughs> I thought, "Oh God, I'm glad I'm not playing in this game today." You know that? So, yeah. So was it was it sleeve or no sleeve day? Uh well, no. I think from a from a. Uh, it was probably a no sleeve day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For players. Now, For I might have. I might have gone. I would have. I might have gone with the heater on the arm. I got gotcha. to keep my arm warm because yeah, that yeah. might have been a little bit difficult. But yeah, you could go no sleeve. All right. Day. So that was that. That was the actual conditions yeah. uh, for the Jets game. But uh, uh, Arch, I'll come right back to you. Anything come to your mind as far as the worst weather condition games that you've played in? Yeah, there's a there's a ton of. Them. <laughs> um, uh, it, but when you com when you combine. This was a really good Jet defense, and not to the vein of the defense I'm getting ready to mention, but it was a defense that's respected in yep. the league right now, yep. a team that can get after the passer and stuff. We played the 85 Bear defense in Chicago in late November, and in oh. it was 25 degrees at kickoff. It, yep. it, the sun was out, yep. and so and there wasn't much wind coming off Lake Michigan. You thought, okay, ideal probably late November day in Chicago. Yep. Then you had to play the defense they had, which had, I think, five Hall of Famers on it. We yeah. didn't know that at the time, but they, they ultimately were that. Yep. But then at halftime, we came out, and it was like we'd been teleported somewhere else in the world. <laughs> we, now, we are now on, on an iceberg somewhere in the North Atlantic because there was stuff blowing sideways. The wind is blowing off Lake Michigan. And something was falling out of the air that resembled ice, and it was the old AstroTurf, and it was sticking on the turf of Soldier Field. Oh, no, and when gosh. you hit the ground, it, like, ripped your arms off. Oh, no. And as you can imagine, against that defense, I hit the ground a lot in that <laughs> So that was, that was brutal, yeah. So then it went from 25 degrees to, like, 5 degrees. It so. went, Mommy, can I go home? That's what it <laughs> uh, I can only imagine walking back out for halftime and be like, bro, what just happened out here? I mean, this oh, place man. is terrible. I'm going to follow you up, Arch, because... Because oddly enough, one of the worst games that I played in was at Soldier Field. And this is when I left to go to Seattle. We played them on a Sunday night football game in December. Mm. Okay? So Ooh. you mentioned a 1 o'clock game. Sometimes you can get by with the yeah. sun still being out, right? Like it's it's manageable. Maybe it tricks your mind a little bit because <laughs> the, it's light out. But when the sun goes down in December by that lake in Chicago, it gets brutal. Okay? <laughs> it gets brutal. Um, so this is mid two thousand. And so this was still Erlacher and Briggs and all that stuff on the defense. And um, one thing I would also say is generally your worst weather 
NFL game are games that you lose, yeah. right? Because when you win, it's like, that's eh, fine, right? Yeah. Like yeah. when we were with the Falcons and we played the Packers, we beat Brett Favre and it was snowing and everything was fine. That was great. It's yeah. no problem. Yeah. It looks good. But we lost that game. And to your point, I was like, can we go home? Mom, I don't <laughs> like this anymore. Uh, so we got two votes here for Soldier Field. Anything you remember, DJ? Don't we uh, go to Soldier Field here in a few weeks too? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> no, later. It's in January, I think, when we go. Oh, my go. goodness. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I remember a game, and I think this is even worse for me. Uh, you guys actually were out there running around and playing. And I lucky – well, I don't say lucky, but unlucky enough for me, I came around in a time where we had Michael Vick and we had Matt Ryan, so uh, I didn't see the field at all. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember us playing in – it might have been Philly. And I remember standing on the sideline wishing I was – like on the practice squad that day. Because I was like, <laughs> if I was at home, I would be so happy. I mean, and I felt bad because I didn't want to be one of those guys that like, okay, you're on the sideline, but every time I look up, you're by the heater. Yeah. Every time I look up, you're sitting on the, the, the warm benches and you got guys who are out there playing who need it. I'm like, bro. If I don't sit by this bench, I'm going to have frostbite or something. And it was cold. I mean, it was rain. It was coming in sideways. And obviously, you know how bad Philly can be. But it was not the ideal place for a guy who was just standing on the sideline the entire game. So I was like, kudos to you fans who come out here and do it every week. Yeah. This oh. one, the life for me. So I was glad I was never uh, drafted to a cold weather team. And majority of the time I was with the Falcons, which is crazy enough, we didn't have many – cold weather games we we either played them early in the year mm -hmm. or we played teams who in cold weather stadiums but we played them at home so yeah. lucky enough for me i didn't have to go to a lot of them but i remember yeah. that one because i was so ready for halftime and i remember halftime came and i was like we cannot go out there already. <laughs> it's halftime, over. Halftime, halftime over is already? over already. My feet are still cold. You had a cup cold. of soup and a cup of coffee. No doubt. Stand up. <laughs> no doubt. You mentioned Chicago real quickly. I know we need to get in on this game. But uh, from an intent, I don't know that I've ever seen more of an intimidation factor pregame in my life than we did a game. You might have been on the team. We played in Chicago. Atlanta plays in Chicago on a Sunday night. And – we go in there and it's freezing. It's really, really cold. Cold, one of the coldest weekends they'd had in that time of December in Chicago. Go figure, right? But we come out on the field and I'm going to walk around the field, just get a feel for what the turf yeah. like and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Brian Erlacher is on the field. Yeah. No shirt off. Six, six foot five. He's got a little tank top on. <laughs> and remember, he's bull headed. Yeah. And he's sweating and steam is coming off of his head. I remember I turned to like four or five people who were standing there with us that weren't going to play anything. We have no chance to <laughs> We haven't even kicked off that, yet. This game's we're, over. We're playing against that guy. We got no chance. But anyway, just funny. Oh, Dude, man. So, nothing. yeah, my close second, by the way, is Lincoln Financial NFC Championship game. We lost that game. I remember they had to shovel the snow out of the stadium before yeah, we played that right. game. That's that right. was a close second. That's right. All right, let's get into actual football because most people that are tough football guys that are listening or watching this are saying, you guys are a bunch of wussies. Football's played in a cold weather and elements. So Until let's get into it. this game that was played in elements. Mm -hmm. Atlanta Falcons come away from a, with a 13 to 8 victory. I, I call it a high scoring Atlanta Braves contest. Um, yeah, we were fortunate we got the Ronald Acuna double. In the <laughs> exactly. Um, but, it, you know, sometimes it goes like that, fellas. Sometimes you, you just don't have. Everything hitting on all cylinders. The 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 conditions don't allow you to operate effectively. Get explosive on offense. Arch, let me come to you. What couple of things stuck out? I mean, obviously the performance by Jesse Bates getting another uh, interception. The defense as a whole buckling down. Second game in a row, not allowing a touchdown. But what part stuck out to you that allowed Atlanta to get this victory? Well, I'll talk about the other side of the ball in the fact that we took care of the football. Yeah. Um, ironically enough, uh, I was out here on Wednesday and. Atlanta, tips, they anticipated this kind of weather. They anticipated yep. what was going to happen. All the quarterbacks, the three quarterbacks were out there, they were dipping balls in water, ice water, and were taking snaps from the centers. Uh, ironically enough, the first snap of the game, Des drops the first snap of the game. But other than that, he did a really good job of taking care of the ball, and I thought it was reflected. Arthur, you, you kind of grow into a game, and he could feel that the game was going a certain direction. Defense playing at a high level. They were playing pretty good defensively as well, especially in conversion situations. So how much do you tailor your play calling, especially with both teams being pinned? You mentioned Bradley Pinion. Yep. Phenomenal yep. game. Field position. M monster game. I think he 44-yard net. See, he had pinned the Jets a ton of times. 
they in turn had pinned Atlanta a yeah. number of times as well. So you got to kind of play call and placate to that to make sure that you protect yourself because your defense is playing at a high level. So I would talk about the offense being, for the most part, uh, injury or, I mean, mistake-free. Yep. Yep. Not a lot of penalties. Now, the Jets were penalized a ton, and they hurt themselves. But Atlanta did a good job of staying out of penalty situation and didn't turn the ball over. And I thought they played into what was going on in the game. Two things generally, and, and I would say playing on the road in the NFL, but you could probably make this argument, playing on the road at any level, is if you play discipline and you don't turn the football over, you're going to give yourself a great chance on the road to win. Turnovers has been an issue, DJ, for yeah. this team. But to come away from that game with a 3-0 turnover differential win, three takeaways, no giveaways, is huge for it. Atlanta proves to, improves to minus three on the season, which is going to be big as they face uh, the Buccaneers. But what stick, stuck out to you that allowed them to get this win? First off, what Arch mentioned, Bradley Pinion, nine punch, 433 yards worth of punts in the ballgame. That ideal. I heard Arthur Smith tell you on the yeah. game, I, yeah. I don't think we want our partner out there that much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, four punts inside the 20-yard line is huge. Changing the field position in a game like that, when we talk about what weather and forcing them to go whole field is a big deal. And then I'll stay on that side of the ball with the defense where you talk about you held them two and a half yards of rush. I mean, they averaged like 62 yards in the game. Two of fifteen on third down, and the one thing that I, I I thought watching this ball game, I thought Ryan Nielsen did a lot of great things with the defense as far as what he what he gave these quarterbacks pre snap and what he's game post snap. I, I I remember there was a time where Richie Grant was right over the center. He takes two guys, slips those two guys, and still gets to the quarterback. Another time they have him lined up outside and he gets to the quarterback for that that forced fumble late in the ball game. Bud Dupree getting home where he's getting blocked by two guys, slips those guys, runs over the back, and retraces his steps and goes back. Calais Campbell in the end zone, him and Bud Dupree do a good job of keeping their 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 their, their connection as far as getting upfield. And you got two linebackers, both of them, Lamb and Ellis, downhill. They missed the tackle, but then here comes – here comes Calais, here comes Bud Dupree retracing their steps, and they still get a tackle for loss. This was the ideal thing where you say you got so many guys with so many hats to the football and showing these quarterbacks a lot of different things, pre-snap to post-snap, that I thought confused them a lot of the times. There were a couple times where the Falcons would have six, seven guys at the line of scrimmage and would drop three guys, and bam, it looks like zone, looks like man – you don't know what it is pre-snap, and then they change to some post-snap. So I thought the looks were really clean. I thought they were concise with, you know, trying to confuse uh, whichever quarterback was in there. And ultimately, you look at the numbers, you say they did their job. So nine straight quarters now for the Atlanta Falcons not allowing a touchdown on defense. And the only team in the NFL this year to not allow a touchdown defensively in back-to-back mm. games. Ryan Nielsen doing a great job. A couple of quotes that I think is interesting if you haven't heard it. Uh, this one from Bud Dupree. Shout out to Ryan Nielsen, man. He's putting us in situations to be able to play ball. He's made adjustments as the season has gone on. It's the calls. It's him bringing the juice to us. That's Bud Dupree. And then Clayus Campbell said one obvious change that has made a difference to him has been deciding to keep more linemen on the field in passing situations. So, again, these are little things that Ryan Nielsen's kind of finding out as the season goes on yeah. as ways to create an advantage on defense. And we talked about Bud Dupree with a couple of sacks, Arch. We talked about D. Alford, six tackles and a fumble recovery in this game. But can we talk about Jesse Bates? Sure. Five interceptions on the season, now sole possession of third place in the National Football League. The prized free agent signing for the Atlanta Falcons this year. A lot of expectations comes with that, yeah. okay? So not only is he number three in the NFL in interceptions, he's got a pick six this year, he's got three forced fumbles, and he's got 92 tackles, which now leads the team. OK, and he's on pace to have the most tackles that he's had in a season in his entire career. Mm. He has been a difference maker. He has been all over the football this year. Sometimes when a guy comes in with this much hype and all the expectations, it doesn't necessarily live up to it. It's been that and then some for Jesse Bates. Yeah, no question about it. Really good to, that you bring up the numbers. Um, how about going back to the guy? The reason they went and got him, uh, Ryan Nielsen uh, was sat down and said, "Okay, what do we need defensively to play the way we want to play? I need guy, I need a difference maker at all three levels." Yeah. The first guy they went and got was Jesse Bates, a guy that had 14 career interceptions in his career in in a young career in Cincinnati, so he had a knack for getting to the football. And then, okay, we're going to accentuate his ability to get places because they're not playing Jesse in the middle of the field. 
<laughs> he's everywhere yes. on the field. He's coming off the edge. He had two or three blitzes last weekend that forced the quarterback into some bad throws in that game in the, in the win against New Orleans. He was in Carr's face on some blitzes. Mm -hmm. This week in the back end, he, he playing center field, gets the interception. You go to the set, the next level, Caden Ellis. Guy's everywhere. He's yep. up in the line blitzing. Now he's dropping back. They're picking up check downs. They're taking away easy throws. And how about David Onyemata in the front and Calais Campbell in the front, mm. the guys they went and got to affect the game. I mean, it's just amazing how those guys have all stepped up. Uh, but Jesse Bates has been, has been the – has been the shark that uh, of all the sharks in the tank. He's yeah. been after everybody. You know, Archie, the one thing listening to you talk about all those three guys and the way we've seen these guys play this year, the one thing that sticks out to me is all their ability to be versatile, to do so many different things. You talk about all those different guys where you're talking about Onyemata who can line up anywhere on that defensive line and be productive. Caden Ellis, one thing that they talked about when he came in was, yeah, he's a good linebacker, but we want to be able to stand him up and be able to rush him and he's seen that. We've seen him do that, be able to get to the quarterback. You just talked about two weeks ago, Jesse Bates is is blitzing, trying to get to the quarterback. This week he's a high hole safety and he makes the, you know, the, the interception and give, I don't know who it was, I can't remember. But the reason he has to throw that football like that, because the DB is in his hip pocket and he thinks he has to throw it at a different angle so that he gives the receiver a chance. But guess what? Jesse's there to make the play. But it's guys working together. If you hear Jesse talk, he always talks about the other guys around him that absolutely help him become the player he is because you're getting a rush up front or these guys are getting pressure on the quarterback. It's so many things that go into it. But I just love the versatility you talk about with all those guys, and it's exactly what Ryan Nielsen wanted. You know, guys, I remember sitting here weeks ago when Grady Jarrett went down, and we were talking about – the rest of this defense is going to have to step up because he's been the leader. Like, yeah. he's he's been the guy on the defensive side of the ball. And to see the guys stepping up around him and making plays and then how this defense is performing is now probably got everybody saying, oh, okay, we can play pretty good defense without having Grady in there. Obviously, we would love to have him because he's a difference maker. But I think it's good to note that, like, one of the best defensive players this organization has seen over the last five to seven years is not in the lineup right now, and they're still performing at this level. So we talk about complementary football, guys. We've talked about how Arthur Smith had to kind of tailor this game plan to what was what he was getting, what mm -hmm. the weather conditions allowed. We talked about Bradley, Bradley Pinion and how the special teams ended up creating advantage with field position. And then we talked about defense, complimentary football. So let's fast forward that to this weekend. I'm going to ask you guys, DJ, I'm going to start with you. How does Atlanta get their third straight victory and stay undefeated in the NFC South against the Buccaneers? I think it's a, a similar recipe of what you saw last week. And in like RJ mentioned, it starts with taking care of the football. Mm -hmm. You think about the turnover that, that they had in this ball game where we punched the football out, we get points off of it. We get seven. You go down, and the beautiful throw to Mike Hill Pruitt for the touchdown was created because the defense got a turnover, gave you an extra possession, and that touchdown is probably the key to the ball game and you getting the win. So ultimately, it comes down to taking care of the football. And I think on the defense side of the ball, you have to do what you've been doing. I think you've done a good job of mixing of when you get to the quarterback, when you play coverage, when you play tight on the outside, and then getting to Baker Mayfield has always been the thing. If mm -hmm. you can get to Baker and force him into some bad situations or force him into some bad decisions, you got a chance to – get a couple interceptions. You got a chance for him to take some shots. He's a guy that wants to take shots down the field, and that guy who has already done it again, Mike Evans, already over 1,000 yards this season. He's a uh, I mean, he went for, what, 70 in the game last week, another 150-yard game. You got to make sure you know where he is because there's certain guys in his league that if you give them one-on-ones, you give them opportunity to, to take over a ball game, they will. So I think getting after Baker is a big deal, but also – understanding Mike Evans cannot beat you in this game is critical for the Falcons at home, which you've played pretty well in. But also, you know, you got three division games left, man. You got you got this one coming up. It's a big one. You win this one, you got a good chance of looking towards the future, which we can talk about, but I know the team won't. Um, so, you know, it's odd how sometimes how we're all on the same page. I just shot my keys to the game that's going to be used for another segment. And, DJ, what my three keys to the game were, Win the turnover margin, <laughs> stay salty on defense, and make somebody other than Mike Evans beat you. It's real. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> 
So is there anything else that comes out to you, Arch? Because those are the three that we've kind of outlined here. Getting after Baker Mayfield as well. But what, what, how does Atlanta get that third straight victory of the season? Well, certainly, I mean, every game you play in, you, gotta, you, you can't turn the football over. So that, that goes without saying, I think. But uh, to me, is the Bucks have found a little bit of ground in the running game. They, they lost to the Colts two weeks ago, but they ran for the ball for about 125, 130 yards. This weekend, they beat uh, Carolina in a close game, one-score game in Tampa. They ran for about 125, 130 yards. That can't happen. Atlanta held them to 73 yards rushing in the first game last time. That's got to be the number. Make Baker have to drop 35 or 40 times in the game to beat you. And re let's remember now, one of the big plays in the game, Baker gets out of the pocket and runs for a first down into Atlanta territory that puts him in position to not just kick the tying field goal, to go win the football game. Mm -hmm. Onyemata makes the sack that forces the field goal on that last drive against Tampa. We didn't face a quarterback that could move this week. Yeah. Both these guys were kind of where they're supposed to be or or wherever. We've had a problem with quarterbacks yeah. moving around. So Baker knows that. Baker knows he made a play against them. So it's not going to be necessarily schedule runs for Baker, but there's going to have to be a, some discipline. This pass rush is coming. You guys talked about it. Bud Dupree. How about Arnold Ebicady? <laughs> the two speed rushes the last guy, two yeah. weeks getting home. You're going to need to see some of that. But the discipline, remember, Ebicady won against Kyler Murray, but that didn't work out. Murray mm -hmm. got out of the pocket. Yeah. So – going to have to be a little bit more disciplined with the quarterback. I would start for me, make sure they're one-dimensional. Make Mike Evans make the plays. Make them make the plays in the passing. Don't let them have a two-way go in the run game. Yep. And do not let the quarterback extend plays. Yep. I mean, so. you mentioned Kyler Murray, Josh Dobbs, obviously. The quarterback runs in those two games ended up being kind of the demise of Atlanta losing. And so, uh, you're right. The last couple of weeks, Derek Carr, um, Boyle, um, not necessarily known as running quarterbacks, but don't want to let that kind of creep up and end up being a difference in the game. Uh, before we close it out, guys, the last topic is this weekend um, is going to be the 1998 celebration. Mm. Okay, 25 years. Um, wanted to ask you guys, DJ, you might be too young. I don't know. If you had a memory <laughs> of the 1998 team, um, I'm going to start with Arch to give you a little bit of time to think about it if you need to. Um, mem any of the memories that stick out to you of that 98 season? Well, the defense was a defense that created major havoc. They had a front four that could get after the pass, or Chuck Smith, maybe the anchor of that defense as far as the, the front four goes. Jesse Tuggle, the tackling machine in the, in the, in the, in the second level, the hammer bringing the noise. But they were really disruptive defensively. If I remember correctly, they led the NFL in takeaways that year had a chance to sit down with Jamal Anderson here during the off season Bro, as we got is, ready for the cel celebration. Brain? How do you remember that? <laughs> oh my it's goodness! Called the Encyclopedia of Knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> <God. Lee. laughs> but Jamal, of course, had a monster year that year, and we remember him doing the the dirty yeah. bird and yeah. stuff like that. But he had a couple of big catches in games too, catching the ball in the backfield. If you go back to the championship game against Minnesota, their number one concern was Jamal running the football. Mm -hmm. Well, they snuffed Jamal out. They took the run game away. But if you go back and watch the game, Jamal makes three key blocks, including a block that allows Chandler to hit Mathis for the score that puts it to sends the game to overtime right at the end of the game. Jamal contributing in any way he could, and yep. that was his contribution, was I got a block because they're shutting me down in the run game. Yep. And Chandler threw for over 300 yards in the game. He mm. was a monster in the game. Uh, both uh, both receivers went off in the game. Mathis had a big day. So that's what rem I remember the NFC title game. Yep. I've tried to forget the Super Bowl, <laughs> much like I tried to forget right. the 16 Super Bowl yeah, for the most right. part, at least the f final quarter. But, yeah, it was a team, a very good team, that uh, havoc on the defensive side – and they would pound you with the run game with Jamal Anderson. Yeah, um, I, I'll just follow real quick, Arch, because I was, a I believe, a junior in college that time at the University of Minnesota, okay? <laughs> and they played against the Minnesota Vikings in said NFC Championship game, and I just remember the buzz – in the city, and I and I wouldn't say that I was a you know diehard or devout Vikings fan, but like that's the team that you grow up watching when you grow up in Minnesota, and they had a fantastic year that year as yeah. well, and so I remember that clash 
in the 98 NFC Championship game with with the Falcons going up against the Vikings. And then as I came into the NFL as a rookie, never thinking that I was going to land with Atlanta Falcons, all of the guys that you just mentioned basically were still on the roster. A minus Chuck Smith was not there. But, you know, I started with the Jamal Andersons, the O.J. Santiago's, T. Matt, Ray Buchanan, Chris Chandler. All those guys were still there, still kind of trying to bust out the dirty bird a little bit still in 2000, <laughs> my rookie year. But I got a chance to to play with a lot of the guys that made up that 98 Scott season. Scott Case still on the team? Scott Case, no, was in Dallas. Dal- he had gone okay. to Dallas. Yeah, okay, he gosh. had gone to Dallas. He won him a Super Bowl, I believe, in 96 with the Cowboys. Okay. I mean, you, you might have been in, like, what, 8th, ninth, 10th yeah, grade see, that's at the why time? I, I'm not even going to sully the waters of what you guys just talked about because you guys gave in great detail. But I remember during that time, all that I cared about at that time, being just a young pup, was – Man, that Dirty Bird looks cool. I want to try that. I'm so at you home weren't trying even, that. You weren't even the legend of shock yet. You <laughs> were still, you were still <laughs> Don Shockley Jr. at that point. He was still on the stove brewing, wasn't he? <laughs> I was trying to eat peanut butter seven to gain weight during that time. You became know. a legend, though. You became right. a legend. You were growing. Uh, and, and on your shirt, you you have the old logo. Now, yeah. granted, the 98 season would still have been the black helmet, but at least it was the old logo. And uh, I, I, I will say I get a little bit of jealous of, of Falcon, uh, Shock's Falcon swag sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes when we That's do this important. podcast, That's I mean, nice I'll just one. this was this was. I mean, I would give people a little insight. Rack, we do some stuff in the game, and they would give us certain things to wear at halftime. Yeah. And Rack would always be kind enough to say, "All right, Shock, I'm gonna let you choose," because he could have easily been like, "Shock, here's what they gave you." So sometimes <laughs> I got to choose what I wanted. Yeah. So appreciate that. Was nice, yeah. I get I get extra tight t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, that the mediums that generally don't get worn again. <laughs> being, a, being, right. being a good big brother. Hey, uh, when, yeah, are, we getting, are we getting ready to get out yeah, of here? Yeah. All right. I got it real quickly. I got to throw some praise out. Clark Phillips the third comes in off the bench at corner. AJ, good call. AJ got hurt in the in the first series of downs coming yep. up to tackle Brees Hall. Clark came in and played a, an unbelievably good game. I had a chance sure. to talk to him on Monday. You talk about a guy that's been dialed in all year waiting for his opportunity. This is a dude that played everywhere for Utah. Uh, last year was a uh, consensus All-American, six interceptions a year ago. He comes here as a fourth-round draft pick, and they've played him in a lot of different places. He got plugged in in corner, and he looks up, and who's standing across from him? Garrett Wilson, the <laughs> reigning rookie of the year. You know what he said to him? Said you ducked me in the twenty two Rose Bowl, man. No, I'm, here really? to, I'm here to get mine. How about yeah, that? Really? Yeah. Remember he sat out the Rose oh, Bowl wow. game because because he was going to the NFL. So I wanted you, he, Dom. He, he, you he ducked me in the Rose that Bowl. All week. So give Clark Phillips a ton of credit. How about Andre Smith coming off the bench as well, taking over for Nate Lamon. Nate yep. Lamon got banged up in the game. Yep. We had a number of guys get banged up on defense, and we'll find out midweek as we as we air this. We're not sure on some injuries. Hopefully, a lot of these guys get back. But it talks about Terry Fontenot. It talks about the staff putting a depth together. When you plug a guy in, there's no step down. You've got guys that can come in that play competently, can play within the scheme, and you don't have to change the system. So shout out to all those guys. Let me give a shout out to to one guy who does a phenomenal job. Is our man Arch right here, and and I say this because after the ball game, he talks to coaches, players, and every week he talks to Arthur Smith. And if you've watched Arthur over the you know last couple of years, it's hard to get Arthur Smith to smile <laughs> or to laugh. Two weeks in a row, Arthur has found a way to get Arthur Smith to smile and laugh. And this week, it was asking about the production of the tight ends. Okay. To get the tight ends the football. So you, so you always know effort. certain yeah. people what gets them yeah, going, yeah. right? Yeah. And when he mentioned the tight ends, you could see a smile come up, <laughs> and then he brought it back. Like, I can't be too excited about it. As we know, Arthur Smith loves the tight ends, and Arch brought it up so – Phenomenal job by you, oh, Arch. Getting, uh, uh, it Coach helps. It now. helps when we win. So <laughs> that, that helps too. Arch, to your credit, like, listen, I'll be, I'll stand here and talk. We could talk Falcons for like an hour, but but, but the powers that be kind of tell they us that, together. yeah, like yeah, we, yeah. for for viewing, like, how long you guys stay and listen and watch, like, there's a certain time period that they want us to cut it off. Uh, but anyway, we could sit here and talk about Falcons and football and breaking things down for a long time. But we'll go ahead and wrap it up. That's the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Atlanta Falcons stay atop the NFC South, and they got a chance to provide a little bit of distance Let's with go. a victory at home this weekend against the Buccaneers. And if and when that happens, we'll be right back here next week to wrap it all up right for you here on the Falcons Audible. Thanks so much for joining us.